Good morning, sisters and brothers of St. Mark's. In the United States today, we as a nation face a choice that we've been avoiding for a long time. It's a choice about where we stand when it comes to disproportionate violence towards our African-American and Latino neighbors. The sad reality is that violence comes to the doorstep, the curbside, the alleyway, and the drive-through of colored bodies overwhelmingly more often than others. For decades as a nation, we have hesitated to accept responsibility and reform, and now those communities affected by this violence have said, enough. A choice must be made for the soul of this nation and for the health and welfare of every person in it. It's good that a choice is being demanded of us. There are other choices we are still hesitating on. We still have not properly faced the reality of fatal violence in our children's schools. We still have not made a clear choice to welcome and care for the foreigners within our borders. At least when it comes to our racism and the violence we permit in communities of color, our hesitation is no longer acceptable. As Christians, people called to be ministers of reconciliation. We should be leaders and ambassadors in our communities for how to face choices of such magnitude. In a world that follows the things which are opposite of God, we have chosen to follow Jesus, to repent and renounce a life lived to the pattern of this world, to trust and believe in God. The gospel is a choice, not a choice we make in a moment, but a choice we make throughout our lives. It's a choice we make together each year when we gather at Easter to renew our baptismal covenant. If we are to be voices leading our country and facing its choice, let us refresh ourselves again on the choice of the gospel and the full meaning of our baptismal covenant. What is the significance of baptism and why is it important? Yes, it's a symbol of belonging to a community, and yes, it's a symbol of our commitment to renounce evil and live with and for God. But there's more to it, and the more is right here in our epistle reading for this Sunday. Now, since we don't have printed bulletins before us, I invite each of you to grab your Bible at home and join me. We're going to open to our lectionary passage which is St. Paul's letter to the Romans in the sixth chapter, beginning at the first verse. St. Paul's letter to the church plant in Rome is one of the most theologically spectacular writings in the whole Bible, and I'll be preaching a couple more times this summer on later chapters from this letter. This particular collection of 11 verses might be one of the most important in the whole Bible, for St. Paul lays out the central meaning of our choice to follow Jesus. Now, looking at the beginning of this passage, St. Paul begins by asking whether we who follow Jesus should keep on sinning so that Jesus can keep on forgiving us. By no means, he says, how can we who have died to sin go on living in it? That's our first clue. We Christians are people who have died to sin. St. Paul explains, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Now, St. Paul suggests here that one of the key meanings of baptism is none other than the doctrine of atonement. Now, I know some of you have had an upbringing a bit like mine where the atonement was shorthand for the belief that Jesus died on the cross because God wanted to punish us. But Jesus let himself be punished instead to save us. And for many of us, that doesn't sound much like the God we have come to know. 
And so we perhaps have shied away from focusing on the atonement or the cross in our own Christian lives. Well, I have some good news. That perception of the atonement is not in the Bible. The Bible gives some fantastic, occasionally misunderstood perspectives on the atonement. And one of the best is in these verses. St. Paul is saying here that through baptism, we participate in the death and resurrection of Jesus. If the other cruel doctrine of atonement focuses on punishment, St. Paul's doctrine of atonement focuses on participation. Why did Jesus die to save us from our sins? Answer, we are a people whose lives have been broken by the evil within us and in the world around us. Again, the choice being put before our nation is a reaction of people who are fed up with the brokenness of our law enforcement and the evil in our legal systems. We live in a broken world. So Jesus has come to save us from that brokenness. How? St. Paul says, by putting it to death on the cross. When Jesus goes up on that cross, he takes all of the brokenness of the world into himself. And he takes our brokenness, our darkness, our pain, the worst of ourselves. And it all dies with him on that cross in an act of love to rescue us. That's why St. Paul says we are dead to sin. We, in the sense of our old sinful tendencies, have died with Jesus on the cross. And that's good news because it means we don't have to live like those people anymore. But, of course, if all we've done is participate in the death of our old selves, we can't very well live our lives. I mean, dead people don't live. Thankfully, Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and what? the life. He has come to bring life and life to the fullest possible extent. And that's what the resurrection is about. We participate with Jesus, with Jesus in the death of our captivity to sin. And then we participate with Jesus in his resurrection from the dead. As St. Paul says in verses six through eight, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And the passage ends in verse 11 by saying, Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So you see, the atonement is not some cruel doctrine to avoid. It's the heart of the gospel and the meaning of our baptism. It's easy to think that all it means to being a Christian is being a nice person and loving your neighbor. But that barely scratches the surface of the life we are to live as Christians. C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity that Christianity is not about making us nice people, but a new creation. It's about fundamental change, metanoia, about reversing the broken life we were leading and instead living in the life-affirming freedom of God in Christ. That's why reading the Bible is so important, because passages like St. Paul's flesh out for us how to live dead to sin and fully alive to God. That is the choice of the gospel, the choice we made when we were baptized. To go into those waters and come up out of their cleansing stream is to plunge into Christ's death and be raised out of death with him into newness of life. I've pressed into St. Paul's letter today because it is so helpful for understanding what Jesus is saying in today's gospel reading. When we understand the fundamental choice at the root of our baptism, 
then we can understand the rather shocking words of Jesus today in Matthew 10. So if you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Matthew 10, and our passage starts at the 24th verse. I love this passage because it implodes our conception of a care bear Jesus. If you think Jesus only ever taught that we are to love one another and that's it, you'll discover that the Jesus of our scriptures demands quite a bit more from us. Here we find a Jesus who says he has come not to bring peace, but a sword, that he has come to turn family members against each other, that anyone who loves their children more than him is not worthy of him. What's up with this? I mean, is this really the Jesus we follow? Don't worry, it's not quite as appalling as it sounds. When we think with St. Paul, and when we think about the protesters in our own streets right now who are risking being shot, bludgeoned, even in some cases being hospitalized, all for the sake of a moral choice, we can appreciate better what Jesus is saying. So let's start with Jesus' clear statement of the choice in verses 32 and 33. Whoever unites their life with the life of Jesus, he says, will have him as their advocate before God. But whoever rejects the life of Jesus will not have Jesus as their advocate before God. Why? Well, because to unite with Jesus is to reject the destructive power of sin in this world. To unite with Jesus is to believe that through Jesus, we and the whole world can be saved from the brokenness of sin. Thus, to deny Jesus is to give ourselves over to the darkness and brokenness, to give power to our evil and our malice and our racism and our indifference instead of the love of God. It's an absolute choice that Jesus puts before us. There's a sense in which to live, we cannot participate in that which kills. That is why he goes on to say he does not come to bring peace, but the sword. This choice divides because some people will choose life and some people will choose death. Just as in our country today, some choose to stand in solidarity with the downtrodden, while some choose to reject their plight and uphold institutions that breed systemic racism. There can be no compromise here because it too is a choice between life and death. Jesus says that this choice will turn children against their parents and family members against one another. Some people, even within the same family, will choose to follow Jesus, dying to sin and resurrecting with him while other family members will choose to embrace sin and reject life. And we can see that again in the protests roiling our nation right now, where families have divided over which side of the issue they choose to stand. Finally, Jesus says that we cannot even love our own family members or children more than him. Because if they are holding on to those things which destroy life, we must not embrace sin just to be with them. We must choose the saving life of Jesus first and then bring that good news to our loved ones who are still captive to this world's evil. For those who hold on to their life will lose it, but those who lose their life for the sake of Jesus and the kingdom of God will find what true life is all about. And that's how Jesus ends this passage. In summary, this is why scripture matters. The more we read the Bible, the more we see the shape of the choice we made in dying and rising with Jesus in baptism, and the more we understand the implications of that choice for our daily life right here and now, then we can live into it. When we check the daily news and we, we hear the debates about police reform and diversity training and institutionalized racism, let us grasp our deep baptismal roots as Christians 
and rise to the occasion this day and the next and the next in making our stand for life, true life, life to the fullest extent, a life which God holds out to every person, no matter who they are, to come and die and live with Jesus in the coming kingdom of heaven. Living for the kingdom starts now with us, the church, with our neighbors, with our families, with the least among us, trusting that through Jesus, God is making and will make all things new.